The Devil May Cry series is one that, despite only being around for about 18 years, has had a huge impact on gaming, and there's a general consensus over the quality of the series' entries. The first game is really good, but a little dated, the sequel is a dumpster fire of issues and only masochistic completionists should play it, the third game is apparently amazing and is usually regarded as the best game in the whole series, the reboot is seen as below average with its bad story, terrible characters, and mediocre gameplay, and five is seen as a great game with some blemishes here and there. But without a shadow of a doubt, the fourth game is the most polarizing DMC game I've ever seen. Some of the game's criticisms are its lackluster story, its gameplay not being as deep as DMC 3, and the newcomer Nero not being well written. Now, despite these arguments circulating the internet for over a decade at this point, I absolutely love Devil May Cry 4, and the fact that I've dumped 12 hours over the past week into this game should reassure that fact. And while it's not perfect, I'm going to try and explain why I love Devil May Cry 4, specifically its special edition re-release. Now let's start off with a common point of contention, the game's writing specifically the character of Nero. Lots of people hate him solely because he took Dante's place as the main character, and our beloved Demon Hunter ends up taking a back seat for most of this game. This is what I'll call the MGS2 effect. While Sons of Liberty's themes and ideas are highly regarded and its gameplay is seen as a good evolution of past installments, its actual story, and specifically the character of Raiden, was seen as a misstep right after the game's release. Fans hated that a younger, whiny, long-haired character whose focus is on saving his girlfriend could possibly replace our favorite lovable main character. I think you can see where I'm going with this. After fans got used to Raiden and Kojima reassured us that there can only be one snake, the fiery hatred calmed down. Sure, there's still some who will voice their rage towards this new character all over the internet, but most have come to like, or at least accepted him, as a part of the canon. And the same thing is happening with Nero. Sure, the writing in this game isn't Shakespeare and is nowhere near as crazy as Kojima's, but its themes and ideas are interesting enough, especially if you're a longtime fan. Now, don't get me wrong, Nero isn't anywhere near perfect and there are genuine criticisms to be voiced about both his and Raiden's initial appearances, but in Nero's case, most of his faults are a part of the narrative. This this is his coming of age story. He starts by resenting God and hiding his demon powers, he then learns to accept said powers, and this burden that he carries as a grandson of Sparta. Nero, as a character, is more of a mesh of both young Dante and young Virgil from DMC3. Nero could have ended up like his father Virgil if he didn't stop his endless thirst for power. We see this especially right in the middle of the campaign, where Nero states, But by the end of the game, he's mellowed out a little. Of course, he still has a bad temper, but he's accepted his place in this world despite the hardship he's been through, similar to his uncle in DMC3. While not everybody dislikes this game solely because of Nero, and some may not even dislike him at all, he's been a pretty polarizing character for most. Because I only played the first DMC and haven't gotten around to playing any of the sequels, I wasn't too connected to Dante. Sure, I still love watching him do weird shit, and it's great seeing him evolve from this serious guy who's occasionally goofy, to this jackass who cracks jokes while still having a sense of maturity, and can easily kill every single boss in this game without breaking a sweat. But I wasn't too connected to him that when Nero showed up, I wasn't too phased by it. And now I love them both, even if Dante is a little better in my opinion, especially when it comes to gameplay. I mean, gameplay-wise, Nero is... alright. It's just that despite him being the main character, playing as Nero feels kind of bare bones. Instead of having multiple weapons like his family members, he only has one sword and one gun. And he doesn't kill any of the demon bosses, therefore he gets no new weapons. But Dante does. Nero obtains his father's sword Yamato halfway through the game, but he only uses it in his DT state. And even then, he's not even half as good as Virgil. And by the time I got to the final Sanctus battle, I didn't feel like I had gotten any stronger. Besides upgrading the reach of Streak, Snatch, my health bar, and DT gauge, Nero feels almost exactly the same as he did at the beginning of the game. It sometimes feels like a regular hack and slash as Nero, instead of the beauty it is to play as Dante, and especially Virgil. Compared to Nero, these two, and even the rest of the playable characters, are in their own league. Even though I'm shit at this game, using the Yamato as Virgil is genuine beauty and doing an air hike, slamming down at an enemy, then throwing them in the air with my sword only to juggle them with my guns as Dante, is probably one of the most satisfying things on planet Earth. When people say that DMC4 is the best game in the series gameplay-wise, I honestly can't back that up. I haven't played DMC 2, 3, the reboot, or even 5, and first game Dante doesn't even compare to how fucking majestic this game's Dante is to play. 
and it's because of this that Nero feels like he's from a completely different game. I understand that this is a coming of age story of Nero coming to terms with his powers and growing as a person, but just give him some other weapon or a different gun instead of this weak shit. Because the way it is, I basically mashed Streak, Devil Bringer, and Buster to get through most of the fights towards the end of the game. It's fine playing as Nero, but there just could have been a little more depth on his front, as much depth that was given to everybody else. Okay, I dipped my toes into the negatives there, but before we dive into those, I want to talk about this game's audio and visual design. I love how the look of this game keeps that gothic nature from the first game, while also shaking up the usual settings for the series. And the cutscenes, holy shit. They're amazing to look at even 11 years later. This is most likely because they had the cast act out the scenes and just use motion capture. This actually isn't uncommon in games, it's used quite often, and it's visually impressive when it's used well. But most games like Until Dawn, Call of Duty, and Beyond Two Souls go into the photorealistic side of things, and this can bring up a whole lot of issues such as the Uncanny Valley, using an actor's likeness, yada yada yada. But DMC4 keeps its art style that it's had since the first game, so now these characters can move and react like real people while still remaining timeless. On top of its good visuals, the soundtrack is absolutely top notch. Instead of going for a feeling of horror like DMC1 soundtrack did, this game's soundtrack goes for more heavy rock clashing with church music. It's it's pretty top notch, and this is extremely obvious in the ending song, Shall Never Surrender, which is also a fucking bop and brought me to tears. Add the time has come on top of that, and this holds its ground as one of my favorite video game soundtracks ever. Now on to something that actually disappointed me, Virgil and Lady slash Trisha's campaigns. When I bought this game, I knew that these were just the main campaign, just with completely different characters, but I was still disappointed. Playing all of Nero's section with Virgil or Lady is a love-hate relationship. On one hand, I love playing as these new characters, but on the other hand, I just fucking finished this campaign. Yes, these both have new cutscenes to open and close these campaigns, but it doesn't explain why Virgil did everything that Nero and Dante did years before DMC4, and why Lady and Trish did the exact same thing as well during DMC4. It just feels like making these additions didn't take much work at all. Just call back the voice actors for a day, record new scenes, copy and paste the entire game, stands the cool cutscenes, and bada bing bada boop, you have two extra campaigns. I guess Yes, this is part of the reason why the special edition has always been only $25. Each character plays dramatically different, and I do love all of these playstyles. Virgil's quick and precise use of the Amato, Lady's destructive firearms and devastating bayonet, and I haven't got to Trish yet, sorry. Now while this is all great, at the end of the day, it's still the same 9 or so hour campaign that came with the base game. I honestly don't know exactly what I would have wanted instead, but I would have loved for Lady or Trish or Virgil to get their own small little journey. One unique to each of them, something to really focus on their character and their playstyle, rather than the same campaign from 2007. Speaking of its value, a game that, at the time, was released 7 years ago, being re-released in 1080p with 60 frames per second, along with new playable characters, more difficulty options, and a couple unlockable costumes, sounds like it could be resold for $60. But Capcom, knowing how much this means to the fans, sold it for only $25. Digitally except for Japan, who got a physical release. Now, I'm not completely anti-digital games, but they aren't my cup of tea. Sure, I bought this game on PC, which is where most of this footage is coming from, but that was, among other things, an impulse buy, like most of my Steam library. I can make a whole video on that subject, but the point is, DMC4, despite being a re-release of, at the time, the last mainline DMC game, was only available digitally. Which is odd when you consider that DMC Definitive Edition was released everywhere physically earlier that same year. Capcom made a statement saying that it's too complicated to release a physical version in the States, and said that if fans wanted a physical copy, they could import one of the limited run Japanese copies. The limited run Japanese copies, which are now, obviously, outrageously priced. Thankfully, it was re-released through the PlayStation Hits moniker and I was able to snag a copy, which after shipping, handling, and probably taxes, it came up to about $40. The originally well-priced remaster now costs just as much as buying a copy of DMC Definitive Edition and DMC HD Collection, which was re-released just last year and are both available physically in the States. Capcom's done this limited run bullshit before and it genuinely pisses me off. It's just small enough that most people will say it's a dumb thing to complain about, and most fans of the game will just concede and buy the digital copy anyways. This doesn't have a big bearing on this game or this video itself. I honestly just wanted to yell about how I spent an extra $40 on a game that I love, because printing a disc and selling it to a gigantic audience of people begging for this product is just too complicated.
When I jump into a game series, I tend to gravitate towards the polarizing games. Games that aren't particularly bad, but very much split the fanbase into two. And this is the same case for Devil May Cry 4. I sometimes regret playing 1, then skipping 2 and 3 in the reboot just to jump to 4, just so I could possibly play 5 next. But after putting so much time into this game and actually making this video, I don't regret it anymore. This video is over twice as long as most of my shit because I actually love DMC4. I say that about almost every single game that I look at, and while I mean it, this game amazed me. I've never seen a game series change so much yet stay the same so much after its initial release. Devil May Cry is a series that I love now, and I totally regret not getting into it sooner. And Devil May Cry 4, so far, is not only my favorite DMC game, but it's up there for my favorite hack and slash game. And it's with that that I'll say, Sayonara.